Here's what I want you to do. I, I want to kind of start off this little thought. Now, it says becoming a contagious church. Well, that was a good word until what? The pandemic. <laughs> And then once the pandemic came along, if you said, hey, I'm contagious, what did everybody do? Whoo! <laughs> so think of that word in a positive light. And I want to share this little illustration with you. There was a, a, a paramedic who was retiring. He had been a paramedic for about 30 plus years. And so the local news station was coming down to do a story. I'm just going to use Sam as the example. He's the paramedic. And so the news reporter comes and begins to have a, a nice conversation with Sam and talks to Sam about his experiences and says, hey, what we want you to do is we want you to tell us one of the most unusual experiences you've ever had. And so he knew the story right off the bat, Lindsay. And so all of a sudden, the reporter puts the microphone in front of Sam's face and says, okay, uh, sir, would you mind telling us the most interesting thing that ever happened to you as a paramedic? He says, well, a call came in from a local church to the 911 station that a gentleman in the church had begun to feel as though he was having some heart situations. He'd become a little bit unresponsive, he, and he began to say his chest was hurting. And uh, so they said, okay, we're going to deploy a paramedic. They'll be there briefly. And so the news reporter was saying, so tell us how that was an unusual situation. <laughs> to which the paramedic said, Terry, well, the problem was we took out four individuals from the church before we became the one that that person had called us about. You see, there were individuals in the service who were unresponsive because the service was lifeless. <laughs> you know, sometimes that's how a service can feel, can it? We sometimes think that you have to be big in order for you to have a lot of life. I'm just going to tell you, in my 40 plus years of ministry, I have been in some big churches that have been too formal. As I've often said, they've started at 11 o'clock sharp and they've ended at 12 o'clock dull. Then I've been in some small churches uh, that didn't have uh, a lot of professional or gifted, as you may say, singers. But buddy, they know how to lift the roof off a sanctuary. So what I want to begin to focus in on with you this morning is this simple thought. What would it take for Crestwood to continue to be a contagious church in this community? Will you pray with me? Father, I just pray that in these few moments as we begin to look into your word, that you'll begin to let us see how this church as small as we sometimes may feel it is, can be a contagious, transforming influence in the lives of others in this surrounding neighborhood. Father, help us all look into our hearts. And may it never be said of us that we've come into your house and it hasn't changed us and shaped us. It hasn't inspired us to live on mission for you. So you speak to us now. For this is your time, and we ask it all in your name. Amen and amen. Before we get into our text, I just want to remind you of two churches. You know those seven churches in the book of Revelation that John talks about? Well, there were two, Smyrna and Philadelphia, that were small. And after commending the church in Smyrna for their spiritual victories, Jesus warns them of the coming persecution in Revelation 2.10. He says these words, Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested. You will have tribulation for ten days, but be faithful unto death, and I'll give you the crown of life. And then the church in Philadelphia, Jesus affirmed their positive actions in Revelation 3.8. He says this, I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door that no one can shut, and you have little strength because you have kept my word and have not denied my name. And then on down in verses 10 and 11, he even continues to praise them for their uh, faithfulness in the midst of trials. He says, because you have kept my command to persevere, I will also keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have that no one may take away your crown. So here's a question before we dive into God's word that I want you to begin to consider and ponder. What would it be like? What would it look like in the community surrounding Crestwood, if they could say the same about us. 
What would you like them to say about us? How about this? What would happen if people around this church began to say the following? They are a community of believers so amazed by the glory of God and so transformed by the love of Jesus and so yielded to the power of the Holy Spirit that people are continually being drawn in and transformed by what they are experiencing when they are in their midst. Would that not be phenomenal? You see, not only do we love Jesus with all our being, friends, God wants us to live for him wholeheartedly. Amen? <laughs> so if you have your place in God's word, Acts chapter 2, and if you're able to stand, would you please stand in the reverence of the reading of God's word? Beginning in verse 42, the Bible says this, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. Selling their possessions and goods, they gave to anyone as they had need. And every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all people. And the Lord added to their number what? Daily, those who were being saved. You may be seated. You know, when I began to think about what a contagious church looks like. The first church that comes to my mind is this, what I call small church, the church in Jerusalem. On the day of Pentecost, it went from 120 to what? 3,000 as they began to give their lives to the risen Christ. Now, what I want you to understand is this. The contagious spirit of a church isn't dependent upon its size or its abilities. Listen to me, a contagious church is determined by the way its members respond to God. A contagious church is a contagious church because its members are open to the leadership of God's spirit and do as God's spirit leads and guides. So here's what I want you to begin to think about. As a community of believers so contagious with the gospel and their love for Christ that people in the surrounding community all of a sudden begin to see their love for them even though they have all walks of life, various ethnic and cultural backgrounds, the church in Jerusalem was impacting them and they were drawn into a new fellowship. There are three basic points I want us to kind of focus in on today. If we're going to become a contagious church, if we're going to be kind of the church that responds to God's leadership and the people around us take note, there are three things that will begin to happen internally. One, we'll build and nurture our relationship with the Lord. We'll build and nurture our relationship with the Lord. Secondly, we'll enjoy being together with fellow believers. And finally, we will serve those who are in need. I want to give you those to kind of begin to think about. So the first one, a contagious church builds and nurtures their relationship with Christ. Can I just ask you a question? Isn't that where it all begins? If we're going to be a contagious church, it's got to start with our own individual relationship with Jesus. You see, before a church can create a contagious spirit, there has to be a deep and abiding relationship within the fellowship. Someone said a long time ago, you can't give away what you don't possess. <laughs> You can't give away what you don't possess. In order for Crestwood to become a contagious church, friends, listen to me. We have to have a love for Jesus more than anything and a love for Jesus more than anyone. And this love for Jesus has to be real and must grow within us on a daily basis. The group of 120 knew Jesus best, and yet they continued to what? Follow him because they saw something within him that drew them unto himself. Friends, I want you to understand something. When Peter preached that dynamic message on that day of Pentecost, they came under conviction and their love for Christ deepened like never before. And you were able to see it in the lives of those who were there and you were able to hear it in the voices of those who were there. Listen to what it says in verse 42 of our text. It says this, 
And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. They continued what? Steadfastly. You know what that means? They were devoted. They were devoted. They were continually having their thoughts and their actions shaped by the word of God. They were gathering together with other believers to worship and to celebrate all that God was doing in their midst. And they were having consistent times of prayer individually and corporately. And they were meeting together for encouragement, support, and accountability. Their endurance and sticking to something didn't come easy than it does for us today. You know, I don't know about you, but oftentimes we'll read stories in the New Testament, we'll read stories in the Old Testament, and we'll say, man, it must have been easier for them to do that than it is for us today. No, it wasn't. The same Holy Spirit that encouraged and inspired them is the same Holy Spirit that's accessible to us today. Amen? You see, there were the same number of outside pressures that even made it possibly more difficult for them than it is today. And yet through it all, it was their love for Christ that kept them committed to one another. I just want to tell you something. When God wants to build something within us, he will build and nurture it as he deepens our own relationship with Jesus. And I'm just going to tell you something. The world out there is pretty sharp at figuring out if we're real in here. Amen? <laughs> because they know you cannot give away what you do not possess. So a contagious church is a church that spends time and effort building on the relationship we are to have with Jesus. Secondly, a contagious church enjoys being together with fellow believers. Listen, as you go back through those texts, 42 through 47, there's one thing that you will see over and over and over, and that is this, a sense of oneness. They enjoyed spending time together. Whether it was around the table, whether it was around uh, the altar, whatever it was, they enjoyed spending time together. And I love what it says. There was nothing that anybody had in need for they freely shared of their possessions with one another. Can I ask you something? Uh, do you remember the day when people could ring your doorbell and say to you, Hey, Pat, do you have some extra sugar? I am making some tea and I just realized I ran out of sugar. And she said, I sure do. Come on in, honey. I'll give you some sugar. Can I ask you a question? Who would knock on their neighbor's door today and ask them that? Well, I'm glad. Because you see, we live in a society now, what we do, we raise our garage door, we move in, we close it, and we say, I dare anybody knock on my door. Because we see our homes as our what? Refuge as our sanctuaries. In fact, some homes, as you drive up the driveway, say, do not disturb. Or I always love this one, beware of the dog. <laughs> That's how we're living these days. You know, it used to be, and Don and Hassel and maybe even Miss Carolyn and all the others who are maybe a little bit older as time, we used to do something, as we said, sit on the front porch. Y'all remember that? <laughs> we used to sit on the front porch and we would just sit there and say, hey! For some of us today, if we sat on the front porch and said, hey! Hey! The next thing that might happen is an ambulance might drive by and take us off somewhere because they thought we've lost our mind, right? <laughs> but the society that we're living in isn't the same society that we used to see so evident. Friends, I just want to encourage you, though. This early church, they found a common kinship. Can I just ask you a question? Has it ever been a head scratcher for you? Why is it God's people can't seem to get along down here when we profess that we're going to spend eternity up there? Maybe it's because some of the people down here aren't going to make it up there. What do you think? <laughs> but we will just, I mean, I'm, I'm just amazed in my short life. I've just seen some people kind of go after one another in the church. I'm thinking, man, do they not realize they're supposed to be brothers and sisters and they're going to spend eternity together and God's not going to separate them. He's going to say, listen, 
folks, you need to put that aside. Amen? This early church was a group of people that enjoyed spending time together. I love what Jesus prayed and what they call the high priestly prayer in John 17 when he penned these words, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they, may, they, they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me, and the glory which you gave me I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may, may be made perfect in oneness and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. As you know, I love to share stories because I believe stories captivate our heart. Again, I don't know the reality of these stories other than they are in those little illustrations that you can share. The story is of a man by the name of Mark Knudsen in August of 1993, he was diagnosed with a pretty advanced form of cancer. He and his wife began to talk about their young children, and they had just gotten, begun to get involved in a local church. And Mark's greatest concern was this. My days are numbered, so what's going to happen to my wife and what's going to happen to my children? Who's going to help look after them? And so they just began to make that a part of prayer. Well, unbeknownst to them, they were a part of a church that took what we just read seriously. And so their Sunday school class and their deacon and some others began to say, we need to go out and pray with Mark. And we need to let him know that we're here for them. And so over time, Ernie, all of a sudden, a group of people began to gather at Mark's house on a regular basis. Now, can I ask you a question? If you've battled cancer, I'm looking at Ernie. There are days that you don't feel like having much company, amen? And there are other days you feel like, listen, stay as long as you want. I'm feeling pretty good. And that's the way it was for Mark. But these folks didn't want to intrude, so they never went inside, but they always brought something with them. And then what they would do is, if they could, they would encircle his house and join hands and sing and pray. And so for the days that maybe there wasn't as large a group, they had a little prayer journal on his back porch. It was covered. And so as individuals would come, they would let Mark know that they've been there and they've prayed for him and maybe even share with him a word of encouragement. August is when he was diagnosed. November is when he passed away. Here's what I want you to understand. From August until November, what had happened for Mark? Mark had begun to see the answer to that prayer, hadn't he? He had begun to realize there was a group of people, a community of faith at his church that truly cared for he and his family and went out of their way to be there each and every day. He had a prayer journal. In fact, that prayer journal was used later as a testimony. And here's the incredible thing that you need to realize. As the church was ministering to Mark, guess who was taking note? His neighbors. His neighbors. And upon Mark's death, at his funeral, there were three neighbors that came to faith in Christ because they said, if that's what church is all about, that you can care for people like you've cared for Mark and his family, I want to be a part of that kind of church. You see, that's a contagious church, amen? One that recognizes when people have needs, we need to be there to help shoulder the burden of those needs. They don't need to walk through that path alone. Friends, I'm just going to tell you something. In my 40 plus years of ministry, highs and lows, I am always so grateful, as imperfect as it is, for the body of Christ known as a local congregation. Because when I'm a part of a local congregation, even this time of transition in my ministry, it creates a closeness and a love with fellow believers. And I'm just telling you, when we have Christ in common, why do we let the small things stand the way of us fellowshipping one with another? Amen? Amen. So a, cont a contagious 
congregation, they build and nurture their relationship with Christ and they enjoy being together. And I just want to ask you a question. You can't fake that, can you? People know whether or not you really enjoy hanging out with them. I, I've shared with you often, one of my mentors was Ray Hamilton. I served with him when I was at Jonesville. And I got a chance to come down at Conoke and serve with him there. And he later went to Bex and became, uh, I think, one of the ministers there on staff. But one of the things Ray always taught me is this. Before you're a people's preacher, you'll be their pastor. And how do you become their pastor? By going to the things that are important to them in their life. And when you go to the things that are important to them in their life, they'll know that you care. And when they know that you care, man, they will do anything to help you along the way. But if they think, you think, you're better than they are, you'll just be their preacher. And you'll never have the joy of being their pastor. I'm just here to tell you, I know I'm not the best preacher, but I pray that I can always be like Ray and that people around me know I care about them. And I love them. And I'll, I'm willing to do anything I possibly can to encourage and help them along life's way. That's who we're supposed to be, right? As we care for one another. And finally, I just want to share with you in closing, a contagious church serves those who are in need. Look at verse 45. In chapter 2, the Bible says, And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as had need. Can I just give you a little thought? Do you believe, I, I believe, do you know that God intended for the church to be the social services of the world? Do you ever think about that? God did not intend for people to have to be dependent upon the government. He intended for people to be dependent upon the local church. Let me give you an example. There was a young mother with five children. She'd begun to go down to the local church. She had run into someone like Angie who was extremely caring and compassionate. Angie had begun to learn this was a single mom with five kids and she began to say, you know what, we've got a food bank. Why don't we help her? So one particular Sunday morning, unbeknownst to this young mom, Angie began to get some of the classes to bring some of the food that day, and that young lady took home five boxes of food. Now, I want you to think about something. That single mom with her five children are going home with five boxes of food they never expected. While she's unloading that food, there at her home, a neighbor notices and says, man, where did she come into all that money that she's able to get some food because she's borrowed money from me to go down and get the grocery store. And they go over and inquire, Harold said, where'd you get this food from? As we sometimes do as neighbors. <laughs> you know what she said? I'm just going to tell you. That place down the street I've been going to, that church, there was a class of ladies down there that had this food waiting on me this morning. No. Yes. No. Yes. Can I ask you a question? <laughs> when we begin to be willing to meet the needs of those who are down and out rather than standing over them, do you not think God uses that as a bridge to allow us to begin to minister to them in even a greater way? You see, the church of Jerusalem, the Bible says, as people had things, they sold those things so that that money could be used to meet the needs of those who were around them. Paul encouraged the church in Galatia with these words in Galatians chapter 6, verse 10. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. Especially to those who are of the household of faith. Now, maybe it's because of the spirit that God generated in the hearts of these early believers, Luke records for us in the front part of verse 47, having favor with all people. You see, when you and I as God's church reach beyond the walls of this church and do good through meeting the needs of others, God will use it to impact many lives for his glory. I was at Maplewood until 2022 we began to be burdened for the needs of our community. And so we began to think, what could we do to help our community out? And so some people in the church began to think, won't we take Christmas and go out to the community and actually give money away? 
So we would go down to the sheets, we'd go down to the food line, we'd go down to the local laundromat. In fact, one summer, the summer of 2022, we did that on a Sunday morning, didn't we? We even canceled church. We went out in the community and were the church. People were, were just amazed. I was standing in Bojangles inviting people to let us have the privilege of buying their breakfast. And they said, what are you doing here, preacher? Aren't you supposed to be at the church? And I said, we decided this morning we'd come out here and we'd be the church. What would happen to the community of Crestwood if all of a sudden we went out there on a Sunday morning and we're the church? Now here's what I want you to understand. Not everybody will appreciate what it is you're trying to do because they'll always think there is a catch. But I want to tell you this little story. There was a story of a man who was making his way down from the Wilkesboro area. He was going to Winston-Salem on his way to his son's funeral. He said to himself, I don't have enough money to get a bite to eat and gas, but I'm just going to stop off here, Lord, in Yakimville and just see what you're up to. He had no idea we were at, at Sheets in Yakimville. When he drove up, some of our folks met him at the uh, gas pump and said, Sir, we're from Maplewood Baptist Church. Would you mind if we just bless your day and fill up your tank? He said, Absolutely. But what's the catch? He said, There's no catch. When they began to talk with him and learn about what was going on in his life, they said to him, Sir, how about we walk in here and get you something to eat, something to drink, and we're going to give you an extra gift card so on your way back home you can get some gas. This is what he asked. Can I ask y'all a question? Are y'all for real? And one of the young people said, I'm not sure, sir, what you mean by that, but I can just tell you this. God has been so good to us. We want to be good to you. We want to be what they call a vessel that God can work through us to be a blessing to you. There in the middle of sheets off 601 and 421 in Yakinville, a group of people wrapped their arms around this gentleman and prayed for him and blessed him in the name of Jesus because they decided they would serve others rather than what? Being served. That's what a contagious church looks like. Amen? I want to tell you the story about a gentleman by the name of uh, I, I could say Giles, but it might be Giles, in Texas. He was driving home from work one day. He doesn't know why, but he looked, and all of a sudden, uh, beside him, he saw this little uh, alleyway. And in the alleyway, he saw two young children, about the age of Jojo, playing. He wondered, why in the world were they in an alleyway? In this part of the town because it wasn't a part of the town that had a good reputation and he could tell at first glance they weren't very well kept and so he decided to pull off he walked over to them and he says can I ask you a question do you live around here and they said oh yeah we live right back there the man looked right back there and there was an old abandoned school bus and he said surely y'all don't live there he said oh yeah we live in that school bus with our dad he's really really sick and that's our home Giles said to those little children, he said, do you think your dad would mind if I go and talk to him for a minute? Sure, come on, we'll take you to him. When he walked in the school bus, he could tell that that man needed to get to the ER. He said, sir, I know you don't know me. I've just met your daughters. I want to ask you, will you allow me to take you to the hospital? You need medical attention. He said, but I don't want to go because if I go, who's going to look after my girls? And he says, sir, I know you don't know me, but trust me, I'll, my wife and I will look after your girls, but you need to go to the hospital. As it turned out, that young man had tuberculosis. Now, you can just imagine, talking about contagious, right? So he wasn't able to really have much more conversation with this man other than through a thick window. All during the time he was in the hospital, he went by and ministered this man and showed him that his girls were looked after and taken care of. They'd gotten them some new clothes and just took real good care of them. It finally got time where that young man was able to get out of the hospital and go back home and through the help of some people in that community, they had found them an apartment to go to and live in. They had furnished that apartment with some new beds and some new furniture and some new clothes and they had a whole pantry full of food. 
When that man, Giles, took that father and his two girls to that apartment, he said, sir, is there anything else I can do for you? He said, yes. Would you please explain to me why you've done all this for me? And he said, it's been because of Jesus. And that father said, I don't know who Jesus is, but if Jesus can cause you to do this for me, will you please tell me more about him? And Giles was able to share with that gentleman and his two girls the gospel, and that man came to faith in Christ. And he says, what do I do now? He says, well, listen, I want to introduce you to my church family, the people who've been helping your girls. And then you can follow that decision up in believer's baptism. And the pastor of that church allowed Giles to be the one that baptized that dad that Sunday morning. Woo! What a day. Friends, I'm here to tell you that's the way church ought to be. Amen? When people take it upon themselves to be what? Christ ambassadors out in a hurting and broken world. So here's what I want to ask you this morning. The Bible says in Acts chapter 2 something that we might just read over and not even pay attention. But the Bible says this early church in Jerusalem, because they were so committed to build upon their relationship with Christ... They were willing to spend time together and serve those who were in need. Look what the Bible says. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. The Lord added to their number daily. Daily. Can I ask you a question? Would you like to see God do that here at Crestwood? Do you believe God can do that here at Crestwood? See, that's the challenge, isn't it? To believe that God is more than able. To take a small group of willing people and to do something supernatural through them that only God can receive the credit for. That's what God does. In just a moment... I'm going to ask Melody to play a little video for us. I'm going to be real confessional with you. It's going to be one of those new songs. It's going to be a little upbeat. I've asked her to kind of start it a little slow, a little low, so it doesn't kind of blow you out of your pew. But the song is, Start a Fire in Me. It's by a group called Unspoken. And the whole principle of that song is this. Lord, I want you to do something out there, but start it in me. Begin it in me. And what I'd like to ask you this morning is this. You remember a couple months ago, a couple weeks ago, I asked you to think about those three things, to pray passionately, to plug in and pass on. This morning, I'm going to ask you, if you're willing, young and old alike, for God to do that in us, in you, I want you to take note of that. Now, I know that for some, you said, I'm not going to come down front. Okay. But somehow, visibly, let God know you're, you mean business with him. Lord, start that fire in me. Maybe, just maybe, there's somebody here this morning that's never opened their heart up to Christ. You've been coming for some time and you've never made that outward decision to follow after Jesus. This morning I want to ask you, would you be willing to yield your heart to him and allow him to forgive you for the sins that you've committed that you can never gain forgiveness for on your own. You can be good and good and good, but you'll never be able to be good enough for what Christ has done for you. And then willing to follow that decision up, just like that father in believer's baptism. Maybe there's people here today, they know they're, they know they're children of God. They've, made, they've settled that. They, they know that if they were to die today, they'd spend eternity in heaven. But they've been looking for a group of people to belong to, a local congregation. They've been sitting, enjoying where they sit. 
This morning, I want to ask you, are you willing to get in the game? And if you are, that means I'm inviting you to become a part of this church family. Become a member. Get involved. Allow your life to make a difference for him. This morning, in just a moment, who is willing to let it start with you? Join me as we pray. Oh, Father, I want to simply pray that as you begin to work in the hearts and lives of these dear people, that we'll rejoice at the way you move. Father, thank you that you've allowed my family to become much more familiar with this precious congregation. Father, I want to continue to thank you for the ministry of their previous pastor and his precious family. And thank you, O Lord, for what you're doing in and through them there at Enon. And Lord, I pray your richest blessing continue to be poured out upon Brother Ben and Lindsay and all of their precious family. Father, I thank you so much for them. But today I ask for those who were here, are we willing to let you start a fire to rekindle that fire so that you might use us like you've used others to draw people who are far from you unto yourself. Oh, Father, it begins with our relationship with you. And then it continues as we enjoy spending time together, willing to meet the needs of all those around us. Mm.